Welcome to CSHE's Certified Healthcare Facility Manager Study Guide. In this section of the study guide, we will be reviewing the planning, design, and construction portion of the test. These topics are taken directly from the CHFM Candidate Handbook. Approximately 18 of the 100 questions on the exam will be on the area of planning, design, and construction with four of these being the ability to recall or recognize specific information regarding planning, design, and construction, and 11 questions being the ability to comprehend, relate, or apply knowledge to new or changing situations regarding planning, design, and construction. Three questions being the ability to analyze and synthesize information, determine solutions, and or evaluate the usefulness of a solution in regards to planning, design, and construction. First, a few definitions that you're going to need to know. An improvement is a change in a facility, system, or equipment that increases the functionality or productivity, enhances the value, or in some way makes the facility, system, or equipment better. An example would be an upgrade to a facility's IT network. An alteration is a change in a facility, system, or equipment that enables it to function dif differently from its original purpose. An example here would be changing a group of med surge patient rooms into ICU patient rooms. Third, an expansion is a change in a facility, system, or equipment that enlarges or expands it. An example would be the addition of a new wing to a hospital. Taken directly from the CHFM handbook, the first area we will be covering is on Developing Infection Control Risk Assessments, or ICRA, and Interim Life Safety Measures, or ILSM. First, Infection Control Risk Assessments, or ICRA, is a multidisciplinary and organization-wide inspection to reduce infection risks. The in-house infection control manager may lead the ICRA team or the facility may hire an independent contractor. The ICRA inspectors consider both the programs the facility offers and the patient population it serves. The phases of the ICRA are planning, which is also known as the programming phase, design, construction, renovation, and maintenance. The elements of the ICRA are processes for design, construction, and mitigation. Design involves planning isolation rooms with air filters, vents, fume hoods, water systems, and services that reduce or control the threat of pathogens. Construction involves limiting disruptions caused by power outages, debris cleanup, and testing for certification by rerouting traffic. Mitigation involves relocating susceptible patients to protected areas, erecting dust and noise barriers, and training staff. The Interim Life Safety Measures, or ILSM, is a guide to mitigate hazards caused by construction and responsibility to complete ILSM falls to the owner. Developed by the Joint Commission to protect the health and safety of patients, staff, and visitors. It compensates for deficiencies in the Life Safety Code. ILSM recommends 36 mitigation measures, and here are a few that you may want to re remember. First, wayfinding helps, such as exit signs and marked pathways. Fire protection items, such as alarms, fire extinguishers, fire suppression systems, and smoke barriers. Hand railings, power tools and cords properly grounded and operational, hard hats, and finally, capped exhaust ducts. Next, we will be looking at developing conceptual feasibility designs and budget estimates. A feasibility study is an engineering evaluation that is part of the planning for a renovation or new construction. The CHFM assembles quantitative data to illustrate the practicability of a particular course of action. The CHFM prepares one study for each possible solution to the problem. Feasibility studies are used to determine the recommended solution. 
the feasibility study should include information on estimated costs, including any real estate purchase, construction, installation, and the price of new equipment. The feasibility study should also address the proposed facility, facility configuration, any loss of production time, and the costs to relocate personnel, equipment, and systems. And finally, list sources or vendors, material prices, and the availability of transportation, communications, energy, and utilities. Next, determining the appropriate project construction delivery method. A construction cost estimate should include costs for site development. Site development costs include clearing and grading a new site, paving access roads, walks and parking lots, installing utilities, meaning electricity, water and sewage, erecting fencing and lighting, and landscaping. Construction costs include everything that goes into actually building the new facility or the renovation, including materials and building systems. Operating costs are the costs to maintain and repair the facility, including custodial services, security, fire protection, and insurance. Support equipment costs include furnishings, installed equipment, and equipment for the maintenance shop. And finally, in the miscellaneous category, you can find design, inspections, and relocation costs. Next, we will look at negotiating contracts for professional services. The project administrator, with input from the selection committee, must negotiate a professional design services agreement with the selected design firm. This contract, once signed by both parties, will legally establish all of the following matters between the two parties, including each party's responsibilities under the agreement, the scope of basic and additional services the firm will provide, compensation, insurance and indemnification, and other legal matters. Next, we will be reviewing design development drawings and specifications for construction and renovation projects. Large projects usually require contract staff who can devote full-time exclusively to the new work. Contractors commonly include a project manager, an accountant, an engineer, a contracting officer, an architect, and finally an interior designer. Next, we will be reviewing recommending awards for construction or renovation work. Several factors enter into the decision to build a new facility rather than renovate the current one. Looking at three of those, the first one, the organization should determine whether renovation would be mostly cosmetic or if functional changes are needed. If functional changes are necessary, the extent of alterations must be addressed. Second, the age of the facility must be considered, along with any changes that would be required because of the Hill-Burton Act of 1947. The updating of the National Electrical Electrical Code in 1967, and the identification of asbestos as an environmental hazard in 1972. And third and final, the impact of renovation on the code status of the facility, the levels of usage, and the impact of changing technology, and the disruption to the operation of the facility that renovation will cause must be considered. Next, Negotiating contracts for construction services. Construction contracts are often awarded through a sealed bid process, but another method of procurement for both professional and technical services is the negotiated contract. The negotiation process starts when the hospital administration publishes 
a request for proposals, or an RFP. The RFP should establish what is to be done and the qualifying criteria, such as experience and specialized personnel. An RFP is the method usually used when the work will cost more than $25,000, and the decision about which company to hire cannot be based solely on the lowest price. Negotiated contracts allow discussion and flexibility with the possibility of a modification of requirements or offers. The resulting proposals should be evaluated carefully by the selection committee, according to technical and financial criteria that have been determined before the proposals are received. Contract administration is a function of the CHFM that is technical rather than legal. The CHFM carefully monitors the work of the contractor to ensure that it meets the terms of the contract. The CHFM reports the contractor's failures to meet the contract terms to the Medical Facilities Legal Department. Contract administration means the CHFM is responsible for the following duties. Bidding or contract negotiation, evaluating bids or price offers, selecting a contractor, handling change orders, authorizing paperwork necessary for payment, supervising inspections, handling claims, and contract closeout. Establish a formal procedure for reviewing the design drawings early in your project. Include the feasibility study and any concept drawings produced by a design firm in your review. Compare the design to the requirement specifications. A few notes. The first design review should be at the 25 or 35 percent completion point, when substantial changes can still be made. You're going to want to conduct another review at the 80 percent to 85 percent completion point to allow finishing touches to be added. And finally, you're going to want to conduct a final review when the design is 100 percent complete, but before actual work starts on the building or renovation. Be sure to choose your builders carefully, whether you need them for renovation projects or for new construction. A few pointers. Interview several builders who have worked before in your local community so you can see their completed projects. Personally interview the manager of each company the builder uses as a reference to overcome the frequent lack of any real information in a reference. Select a builder who has completed a number of successful projects that are similar to the one your facility is planning. Ask the builder you are considering to demonstrate his firm's financial stability so you know work will probably not be halted due to bankruptcy. Meet the proposed project manager to determine if he or she is qualified and compatible with staff at your facility. Base your evaluation on common sense rather than bureaucratic procedures. Be sure that the contractor's risk insurance covers damage to buildings and other structures being constructed or to the existing building in which the construction is being carried out. The second covers liability for the third-party claims for injury and death or damage to third-party property. Modern forms of contractors' all-risk policies cover both. Gross space or gross square footage refers to the footprint of an area and includes walls, partitions, internal corridors, minor utility columns, and the usable spaces. Net space or net square footage refers to the space within an area, department, or room that is actually usable. Net square footage can be defined as the area inside the walls of a space or room. Department gross square feet is the designation most often used in facility planning. Department gross square feet is the footprint for a particular department, but does not include such common areas as lobbies, public corridors, elevators, stairwells, toilet facilities, exterior walls, major mechanical spaces, and such shared spaces as housekeeping storage. A guaranteed maximum price contract fixes a maximum cost for the project 
and encourages the contractor to bring the project to completion at a lower cost. A cost plus percentage contract allows a fixed percentage to cover overhead and profit for the contractor. This type of contract does not encourage the contractor to cut costs. A cost plus fixed fee contract limits the cost ceiling and sets the profit margin. A cost plus fixed fee with upset figure contract fixes a cost ceiling while allowing the contractor to make a profit if the costs are lower than the ceiling. Also reviewed in detail during the finance portion of the study guide, as you will also need to know about fixed price incentive fees, firm fixed price, time and materials. Next, we will be looking at developing construction schedules. Develop a timetable or schedule before the actual start of construction. Include the start date and expected finish date for the construction of the project in the schedule. Indicate the expected completion dates for several major divisions or phases of the project. Make your schedule flexible since problems may be caused by weather, materials availability, labor issues, and other disruptions. It is the responsibility of the facility manager to monitor the schedule and ensure that each phase of the work is completed on time. Next, we will be reviewing coordinating new project activities with architects and engineers, authorities having jurisdiction, general contracts and subcontractors, and stakeholders. The details of partnering vary from one project to another, but it is a structured process through which the partners encourage innovation, teamwork, and problem solving by the team and continuous quality improvement. Typical characteristics of a partnering agreement include a clear role for each partner, establishment of project priorities, methods of building trust and resolving differences, and establishment of methods for measuring success. Next, we will be reviewing submittals and shop drawings for construction and or renovation projects. Design plans can be broken into the following types. The base plan is a drawing on which permanent and structural features are indicated. A demolition plan is a drawing on which walls or partitions, electrical units, plumbing, telephones, and such features as cabinets and other built-ins that are to be removed are indicated. Demolition plans are used in renovations and remodeling projects only. The installation plan indicates the locations of modular panels and the sources and locations for electrical power. The component plan indicates the locations of components to be placed on the panels and specific lighting for workstations. The floor plan indicates the placement of furniture. Renderings and perspectives are design drawings that present a three-dimensional view of an enclosed space rather than providing instructions to a builder or installer. Note that these drawings may not be to scale. They show the space as it will be seen by a user and include the colors and textures that are to be used. Furniture and the relationship of the furnishings to the architectural features of the space are represented in the drawings. Renderings, which cost more than scale drawings, can be used to show administrators and other users how the finished space will look. Shop drawings are drawings that a contractor produces to show what and how he expects to build to meet the terms of the contract. The facility manager reviews the drawings to determine that the contractor is staying within the parameters of the design for the project because the end product is the responsibility of the facility manager. The facility manager gives the contractor clear guidelines for the project. The contractor may need to produce only one set of shop drawings. 
However, if the contractor is hired before the final determination of the scope or design of the project is established, then he or she makes a set of drawings for each possibility. It is the facility manager's responsibility to provide adequate guidance to the contractor and to review the drawings. Next, managing the planning processes. Baseline data must be compiled at or before the start of the planning process. Include the following internal baseline data in your planning. Range of current services, patient mix, number of staff, scheduling patterns and workloads, major diagnostic and treatment units, the age and continuing life expectancy of the equipment, floor plans of the departments, and the number of inpatient beds and nursing stations. The collected data should also include an external site plan with boundaries indicated, traffic patterns, parking, and entrances to all buildings. Expected changes in services, patient mix, and technology should be part of the data. Current deficiencies should also be indicated. Pre-design planning should be the first stage of a construction or renovation project and should include the following. Makes a set of decisions to guide the project through its design, construction, and operations. Puts into words and conceptual drawings general concepts of what is needed. Determines how this project fits into the organization's strat strategic and business plans. Establishes size of the project, including square footage, staffing, and new equipment, along with the expected effects of technology. Identifies the exact location and states whether the project is to be a new facility or renovation of the current one. And finally, uses a sensitivity analysis to determine if the project is feasible by estimating the costs and revenues for internal rates of return. It is a mistake for the facility manager to rush in, into the design phase of a building or renovation project before comp completing pre-design planning. Lack of pre-design planning can result in a facility that is overbuilt or not entirely appropriate for its purpose. An incompletely designed project does not fit well into the organization's overall strategy for capital investment and may cause an unjustified increase in operating costs. Pre-design planning can be used to produce a facility that fits the needs of the current organization and that has the flexibility and adaptability to meet changes in technology and medical practice in the future. Quality control of a project typically falls to the architect, but may become the responsibility of in-house personnel. Quality control therefore requires careful selection of contractors for the project, Efforts to screen out those who do not have a satisfactory record will result in more reliable and capable workers. Next, frequent review and oversight by the facility manager and the experts committee to ensure that the project is completed on time, within budget, according to design, and that all applicable code requirements are met. And finally, hiring a construction inspector for a large project who is qualified for the type of construction that is underway. Benchmarks are points of reference or standards against which something can be measured or judged. Healthcare benchmarks are measured by surveyors for facility accreditation. Benchmark types useful in facilities planning include the ability of the physical plant to carry the current workload, the overall adequacy of departmental spaces provided for procedure areas, the productivity of the spaces, and the efficiency of the spaces, which may be a net to gross ratio. Note that spaces are commonly measured in department gross square feet. Benchmarks can be used in the development of preliminary estimates of space needs in a new or renovated facility. Before making the decision to spend the funds to upgrade or expand a department, the facility manager must ask the following six questions and determine credible accurate answers. 
Could changes such as expanding the hours of operation or reconfiguring the department eliminate the need to upgrade? Could the department be moved to a location that would facilitate the sharing of staff or procedure rooms with another department? Would the relocation enhance client and patient services? What is the current age and condition of the equipment involved? Is it up to date or is new equipment needed? Are current support spaces adequate to meet the needs of staff and patients? Next, evaluating construction change order requests and request for information. Avoid add-on or additional construction costs by providing contractors with complete plans and specifications. If a change in the project must occur, a change order is used. It is a written form by which a company can alter the scope of work section of the contract with a builder or other contractor. The project manager costs the change and generates the order. Change orders solve problems with incorrect estimates, substitutes, construction obstacles, budget changes, and demands for new features. It can be used to alter the quantity of what is provided or the quality or method of the work. And it can also be used to modify design details. Once the facility and the contractor have agreed on the requested change, the change order becomes a legal contract. Next, request for information or RFIs. There are essentially two forms of RFIs. First, common business practice in which information about potential suppliers is acquired to make a supply or service decision in a business RFI. Usually constructed in a table or grid so the information from various companies can be compared. And it is often used in conjunction with a request for proposal, a request for quotation, or a request for tender. The next form of RFI is the construction form. It is often used to confirm a detail or specification. It is also acceptable for a subcontractor or vendor to use an RFI to express concerns about inferior products or the misuse of a product, or to clarify the intended use of a product by the owner of the building. Next, conducting construction project status reviews with administration teams. The facility manager makes regular reports on the status of a project to the policy committee, which we will cover in the next slide, and the executive team of the healthcare facility throughout the duration of a project. It is a good idea to also share the reports with the senior user of the new or renovated facility and the supervisor to whom the facility manager reports. When the project involves ideas or technology that are new or innovative, mock-ups may be helpful. Mock-ups can sometimes be supplied by a vendor. As mentioned in the previous slide, a policy committee is the top level of direction and control for a major project. Members of the committee include high-level executive, such as a vice president, and they typically serve as the chair, a representative from the controller's office, legal counsel, facility managers, the project managers, the manager of the design or construction team. The committee is responsible for approving any major changes in the project, keeping the CEO and board of directors informed of progress and problems, and dealing with issues forwarded to it from the experts committee. The chair sends out the agenda prior to an upcoming meeting, and the secretary keeps minutes as a legal obligation. An experts committee is the lower of two levels of direction and control for a major project and usually has less authority than the policy committee. A typical experts committee is made up of the following. A project manager, design team manager, 
the builder's manager, in-house design chief, operations chief, or chief engineer, the legal counsel, project accountant, the chief inspector, a security or safety representative, and finally a staff representative. The experts committee is responsible for making the daily decisions that allow the project to progress on schedule and within the budget. The experts committee refers issues to the policy committee. Next, directing the engineering and construction of new buildings and healthcare facilities. The facilities administration orders a post occupancy evaluation approximately six to 18 months after a major project is completed and the new or renovated facility is occupied. As part of this, it should be measured how well the goals of the project program were met and also should include gathering information from the staff and users of the facility, including patients, visitors, and family members concerning the program's effects. And it may solicit opinions from special interest groups such as EMTs or emergency medical technicians, police or disabled people who frequent the new area. Note that needed corrections and adjustments should be identified along with any corrective action that should be taken for any similar project in the future. A punch list is a list of tasks that must be accomplished. Put simply, this is a to-do list. It is a list of items identified during an inspection of the substantially completed project as incomplete or failing to meet the specifications of the contract. It can also be equipment or material that is not installed correctly, non-functioning equipment, a portion of the project that has not been completed, or unrepaired damage. It can also be the final, also the final payment for the project is often withheld until after all the items on the punch list have been completed or corrected. Next. Ensuring that all construction and renovation projects are completed according to developed drawings and specifications. As-built drawings are construction drawings that are modified from their original form in order to show changes made during the building process. They may be derived from prints that have been marked with the changes, other drawings, and additional information supplied by the contractor. Operational tests determine whether a building's mechanical and electrical equipment and systems are functioning properly. The tests are devised by the company that owns the building and may be used as part of a check on quality before a project is accepted as completed. Next, commissioning and accepting projects. When a major project is completed, there are numerous tasks that need to be completed during turnover from the builder to the owner, including, but not limited to, punch lists should be completed, operating tests of all equipment and building systems should be completed by the hired inspector and owner staff, any necessary training for the staff should be conducted, documentation should be given to the owners to include as-built drawings, warranties, schematics, and instruction books for equipment, and maintenance information for equipment. Potential facility managers and CHFMs should familiarize themselves with the AIA documents available on their website. CHFM test takers will likely see questions regarding these documents. As an example, Though the owner and contractor sign the substantial completion document to agree to the terms set forth, the architect is the actual signing authority for the document. A best practice that is often used is called commissioning and may be used to handle the turnover. There are three typical definitions and uses for commissioning. The first is building commissioning. When a building is initially commissioned, it undergoes an, an intense 
quality assurance process that begins during design and continues through construction, occupancy, and operations. Commissioning ensures that the new building operates initially as the owner intended and that building staff are prepared to operate and maintain its systems and equipment. Next is retro commissioning, which is the application of the commissioning process to existing buildings. Retro commissioning is a process that seeks to improve how building equipment and systems function together. Depending on the age of the building, retro commissioning can often resolve problems that occurred during design or construction, or address problems that have developed throughout the building's life. In all, Retro commissioning improves a building's operations and maintenance, or O&M, procedures to enhance overall building performance. Recommissioning is another type of commissioning that occurs when a building that has already been commissioned undergoes another commissioning process. The decision to recommission may be triggered by a change in building use or ownership, the onset of operational problems, or some other need. Ideally, a plan for recommissioning is established as part of a new building's original commissioning process or an existing building's retro commissioning process. Next, coordinating building system improvement projects. Routine work and pre preventative maintenance should not be turned into projects. Project status may be based on a dollar value, such as above a specified amount, like $5,000, or the amount of planning and design required. Capital projects usually involve renovation, modification, or new construction, but likely would not involve the purchase of new furniture or furnishings, unless they were part of a new or renovated facility. Annual projects that are discretionary or that are not too urgent to be delayed, non-routine services, work requiring a high level of user involvement, and major repairs should be handled as projects. Capital projects are typically large projects that are financed with capital funds rather than through the facility operations budget. Capital projects must be approved by an upper-level administrator because they are strategic operations and require large amounts of time and money. Capital projects may involve real estate acquisition and major construction. On the other hand, churn projects are less expensive than capital projects. And churn projects require less preparation and are often paid for from a de departmental budget. Churn projects may involve the relocation of employees and may be for the purpose of changing the function of an area. Some construction and or renovation may be part of the project. Next, assuring that specification requirements are met on system improvement projects. Building systems checks should identify equipment that is not operating at optimum efficiency or that is developing problems such as overheating or excessive vibration. The severity of the inefficiency or operating problem determines whether the equipment should be repaired, replaced, or moved to an area where it will get only light use. Electrical and communication systems may need enhancement or replacement when they are no longer sufficient to meet current needs. Next, we will be looking at coordinating planning for special maintenance, upgrades, and renovation projects. Computers have enabled the automation of project management systems. Microsoft Project is just one example of commercially available software for automating project management, which is available to facility managers. Some project management software systems have the ability to manage multiple small projects. Next, managing healthcare facility space programs and process for allocation of space.
Renovation or new construction can consolidate various outpatient, pre-admission, and same-day testing, treatments, and procedures that were scattered throughout the facility. Same-day services include such procedures as endoscopies, IV therapy, blood transfusions, biopsies, and imaging procedures. Scattered procedure units may have redundant areas for check-in, waiting, preparation, and recovery that could be combined into a shared area as part of a medical procedure unit. A medical procedure unit typically needs the items that are shown currently on the screen. Some hospitals consider alternatives to tradi traditional intensive care units as a way of dealing with economic and staffing problems. Patients in tra traditional ICUs require one-on-one -on -one nursing care and are prone to dangerous antibiotic-resistant infections because of the high humidity, warmth, and low lighting. Some alternatives include acuity adaptable, which allow critically ill patients to be monitored and cared for without the need for placement in a special unit. Day recovery centers, which are cardiac which allow cardiac patients recovering from invasive procedures to be monitored for 12 to 40, 24 hours. Chronic ventilator units are for patients who are dependent on ventilators. And chest pain centers have patients with chest pain which can be observed and evaluated. The Operational and Space Program document provides all the information needed by the design architect when he or she begins the schematic design for a project. The OSP document should be developed through the process of examining and rethinking the following. Operational processes, technology use, the enhancement of operational efficiency, facility investments, compliance with the applicable codes, aesthetic considerations, improvements in services to clients and patients. Once approved by the administration, the document can function as a control mechanism for the member of the design team during the development of the design for the project. Next, Reviewing infrastructure needs for capital equipment installations. The first major topic is bedside computing, which is a real-time computing system that links all patient care activities, including prescriptions, lab tests, nursing protocols, and charting procedures. Some of the benefits include they can significantly reduce the amount of time caregivers must spend on paperwork, such as charting. Accounting can use the procedure codes for billing purposes. You can reduce medication and charting mistakes. And it allows the real-time sharing of patient data among all personnel involved in the care of the patient, including consultants who are off-site. It can also make tracing easier for quality assurance, risk management, and infection control. And finally, some accept information from telemetry devices that monitor the vital signs of a patient. The features of an effective bedside computing system are shown on the screen. Some of the key points shown here are, in-room equipment is small, durable, and well insulated to withstand accidents such as being dropped or knocked over or sprayed with chemicals or body fluids. Flexibility and expandability to grow with the organization. The ability to network with all other organization computers so that data can be quickly and easily shared throughout the organization. And having strong backup and security that meets HIPAA standards. Next. Developing institutional design standards. 
Telephone lines and the newer fiber optic systems are used increasingly for sending and receiving faxes, video texts, and other types of data transfer. The infrastructure of the facility must support networking for the organization's computer system and both in-house and outside telephone calls. Lines must be secured to comply with privacy laws like HIPAA. Plans for a new structure or a renovation must include those items shown on the screen. Since many architectural engineering firms do not have the expertise to design the needed systems for data transfer and telecommunications, services of a communication specialist must, be, must often be contracted for their services. Next, socially responsible design. There are essentially five characteristics of socially responsible design. The first is, the design is based on a value system that is shared by patients, staff, and visitors. Second, the design is based on information gathered through interviews and surveys of users, a literature review, visits to other facilities, and the development of potential designs through the use of simulations. Third, the, des the design is developed through a participatory process that helps to mesh the objectives of the users and planners with those of the architects and designers. Fourth, regular systematic review of the design is part of the process. And fifth, periodic evaluation of the completed project is an ongoing process. Next, developing cost estimates, specifications, and drawings for new systems, components, controls, construction, and renovation. Design flexibility is becoming increasingly important for healthcare facilities to be cost effective. Three factors contribute to the need for flexibility. First, changes in the population served by the facility, such as increased ethnics. Second, changing needs of the patient population that necessitate alterations in services or service delivery, such as increased elders. And third, new technology requirements for different spaces and infrastructure amendments. Diagnostic equipment is much larger now than the equipment in use only a few years ago. An example is an MRI machine, which are becoming more popular than the smaller and cheaper X-ray machines. Such size increases may continue, or nanotechnology and other electronic subminiaturization sub may make large diagnostic equipment obsolete and reduce the space required. Healthcare facilities need to be able to expand or decrease spaces as needed. The base construction cost of a renovation project can be estimated as a percentage of the cost of new construction depending on whether the renovation is minor, moderate, or major. The total project cost can then be estimated by adding the anticipated costs for the items shown on the screen. It should be noted that a contingency factor of 10% should be added to cover costs that cannot be identified at the beginning of the project. Next, reviewing new projects with bidders. Whether it is for construction, professional services, or any other work, the facility manager must assemble a list of exact requirements before publishing a request for bids and should include the following. The project specifications, the exact requirements for the job, price level, certification of personnel who will do specialized work, specific materials to be used, maintenance that will be required. The request for bids may also indicate that the bidder must supply references and examples of previous projects to qualify for consideration. Government facilities usually post RFBs on their websites, 
and private facilities may publish RFBs in the local newspaper. Next, reviewing plans for the building. Planning for a new facility or for a renovation must take into consideration the current state of the organization's use of information technology and likely updates and expansions. Also, interstitial spaces are service floors built between the primary floors of a structure and provide for safe, secure room for electrical, HVAC, and other mechanical services without creating obstructions or hazards on the primary floors. They allow access for maintenance, repairs, upgrading, and major changes to the building systems without interfering with the offices, treatment areas, and patient rooms on the primary floors. The flexibility interstitial spaces provide can be very important to a healthcare facility, but the cost they add to a building put them beyond the budget of many organizations. Next, representing organizations with contractors, architects, inspectors, and suppliers in matters related to healthcare facilities. When working with contractors, the facility manager often has the responsibility of communicating all the requirements and needs of his organization to the firms involved in a project, ensuring project completion within budget and on schedule, safeguarding the healthcare organization's best interests, including the health of its employees and the productivity and efficiency of the facility, and to exercise due diligence as a condition of continued employment. Next, verifying equipment planning processes for new equipment required for expansion projects. Many technical services are specialized to the point that they require professionally qualified personnel. University teaching hospitals and other large healthcare organizations may find that they can justify full-time personnel for such positions. Smaller operations may need only a part-time specialist in a particular field. Many companies who have a qualified person on staff assign that person to the task on a part-time basis. If there is no such person on staff, the facility manager may contract with a qualified consultant for intermittent service in each area of need. Such consultants are often paid a retainer fee plus an additional amount for actual service. Stipulate in the contract that your facility requires on-call emergency service. Next, we will be going over some various study questions. Note that some of the questions may seem dated, but many of the topics are still covered in the CHFM exam, so individuals should familiarize themselves with the subjects. First question, a project estimator is developing a cost estimate for construction of a new diagnostic imaging wing. The project costs are shown on the screen. Expected contractor expenses are A, $1.6 million, B, $1,950,000, C, $2,850,000, D, $3,550,000. Answer B is the correct answer here. Normal contractor charges do not include annual utility costs portable equipment, and annual depreciation. All other charges apply. So you take the $700,000 plus the $50,000 plus the $1.2 million to get a total cost of $1.95 million. Which of the following contribute to typical general contractor fees? One, permit and inspection fees. Two, general conditions. Three, overhead and profit. Four, site condition assessment fees.
answer A is the correct answer here because answers 1, 2, and 3 are all correct. Answer 4 is false because site condition assessments are typically done before a contractor is chosen and the fees are the responsibility of the owner. A project has a budget of $6.6 .6 million. Planning and design fees are estimated at $700,000 and construction expenses are estimated at $5.1 million. What is the amount of a 10% construction contingency? Is it A, $510,000, B, $580,000, C, $660,000, D, $730,000? Answer A is the correct answer here. A construction contingency is a percentage of the construction expense of the project cost, or 10% of $5.1 million for a total of $510,000. The process of a hospital construction project closeout by the con contractor includes, one, a punch list, two, operations and maintenance manuals, three, as-built construction drawings, four, final cleaning to be readied for patient use. Answer A is the correct response here. A hospital construction project closeout is performed by the contractor. This process includes a punch list, operations and maintenance manuals, and as-built construction drawings. Answer 4 is false because final cleaning is typically done by hospital housekeeping staff and is not a function of the contractor. According to the guidelines for design and construction of hospitals and healthcare facilities, AIA, the minimum door size for inpatient rooms in new construction is A, 2 feet 8 inches, B, 3 feet, C, 3 feet, 6 inches, D, 3 feet, 8 inches. Answer D is the correct answer here. This is the minimum requirement for new construction according to the AIA guidelines. With regard to generally accepted construction management practices, a contract is finalized when A, the contract is signed by an authorized representative of both parties. B, a letter of intent is issued by an authorized representative of the party receiving the services. C, a letter of authorization to proceed is issued by an authorized representative of the party receiving the services. D, a purchase order is issued by an authorized representative of the party receiving the services. Answer A is the correct answer here. A signed contract binds both parties to the verbiage within the document. When designing a new air conditioning system, the equipment must be capable of maintaining six air changes per hour. Which of the following areas can be accommodated? One, procedure room. Two, newborn nursery suite. Three, critical care unit. Four, endoscopy room. Answer D is the correct response here because answers two, three, and four are all correct. According to the AIA guidelines, newborn nursery suites, critical care units, and endoscopy rooms require a minimum of six air changes per hour. Answer one is false because procedure rooms require 15 air changes per hour. Which of the following have the authority to approve the omission of an alcove for a new mammography machine with built-in shielding for the operator? Is it one, OSHA, two, the EPA, three, certified physicist, four, state radiation protection agency? Answer D is the correct response. Certified physicists 
and the State Radiation Protection Agency are specifically identified in the AIA guidelines. Answers 1 and 2 are both false because OSHA and EPA do not give variances. In which of the following phases of a construction project is an Infection Control Risk Assessment, or ICRA, best initiated? Is it A, the programming, B, the bidding, C, the construction, or D, the commissioning? Answer A is the best answer here. According to the AIA guidelines, the owner shall initiate an Infection Control Risk Assessment, or ICRA, during the programming phase of a construction project. Additional costs could be incurred if the ICRA is done at a later stage. When developing square footage costs of a formal lease, which of the following are critical to calculate gross square footage? Is it one, shared common areas, two, vertical penetrations, three, dedicated parking spaces, four, shared mechanical rooms? Answer B is the correct response here because answers one, two, and four are all correct. Answer one is correct because the tenant could be charged for utilizing space that is considered shared. Answer two is correct because vertical penetrations, such as elevators and stairwells, are used by more than one tenant. And answer four is correct because shared mechanical rooms would not be charged to an individual tenant. They could be charged as a shared cost or taken on as an owner's burden. Answer three is incorrect because parking spaces are not included. Which of the following types of lighting should be provided in patient rooms according to the AIA guidelines? Is it one, general lighting, two, task lighting for staff, three, patient reading light, or four, night light? Answer C is the correct response here, because answers 1, 3, and 4 are all correct. General lighting, a patient reading light, and a night light are included in the AIA guidelines. Answer 2 is false, because although a staff task light is desirable, it is not required for the AIA guidelines. Which of the following are design standards typically dictated by the facility for a renovation project? One, the door hardware. Two, light ballast. Three, plumbing fixtures. Four, drywall. Answer A is the correct response here because answers one, two, and three are all correct. The facility typically chooses door hardware, light ballast, and plumbing fixtures to match ex existing installations and what is already in an inventory. Answer four is false because drywall is a part of the specification, but is not normally part of most design discussions with the facility. According to the AIA guidelines, the minimum number of air changes required for a soiled linen storage room is A, four, B, 6, C, 10, D, 15. Answer C is correct here. The min minimum number of air changes is 10. A patient unit contains 10,000 gross square feet. The unit is composed of 30 patient rooms of 200 net square feet each, and circulation or utility of 3,000 net square feet. What is the percent net to gross square feet ratio? Is it A, 20, B, 60%, C, 80%, or D, 90%? Answer C is the correct answer here. Total net square footage is calculated 
by taking 30 times 200, which equals 6,000. You add that to 3,000 to get a total of 9,000 net square feet. The ratio of net to gross square footage is then calculated by taking 9,000 net square feet divided by 10,000 gross square feet, which equals 0 0.9 or 90%. Using the diagram on the screen, which of the following comments should the facility manager make to the architect that submits this schematic design for a new patient room? A, a hand wash sink for staff must be provided in the patient room. B, the door to the toilet should not swing out. C, the patient's room is too small. D, the corridor is not wide enough. Answer A is the best answer here. According to the AIA guidelines, it states that in new construction, a hand washing station shall be provided in the patient's room in addition to that in the toilet. Which of the following require negative airflow with respect to adjacent areas? One, clean linen storage. Two, dietary day storage. Three, hydrotherapy rooms. Four, trash chute rooms. Answer D is the correct response here because answers two, three, and four are all correct. This is identified in the AIA guidelines. Answer one is false because clean linen storage requires a positive airflow in respect to adjacent areas. When redesigning the critical care unit, which of the following should be the first step? A, design development. B, scope development with the owner user group. C, budget estimate development. D, construction document development. Answer B is the best answer here. The owner user group defines the scope and functionality requirements of the project prior to all other project phases. Which of the following is not an interim life safety measure or ILSM? Is it A, smoke barriers, B, capped exhaust ducts, C, fume hoods, D, hand railings. Answer C is the correct answer here. Fume hoods are used in isolation rooms to control or reduce the risk of pathogens. They are not an interim life safety measure. Choices A, B, and D all are. Smoke barriers are mitigation measures to protect the health and safety of patients and staff during the construction. Capping exhaust hoods is also a mitigation measure, and ham railings contribute to the well-being of occupants. Interstitial spaces allow a healthcare facility to A, consolidate office space in one area for improved efficiency, B, stay within the budget for a new building project, C, improve security by separating high-risk areas, or D, upgrade HVAC systems without impacting patient areas. Answer D is the correct answer here. Interstitial spaces provide separate floors for electrical, mechanical, and HVAC services, so maintenance and upgrades can be done without disturbing patient, treatment, and office areas. Interstitial spaces have nothing to do with office areas or improving security, and they add substantially to the cost of a new building project. As a contract administrator, the CHFM is responsible for which of the following? A, issuing an RFP or request for proposal. B, authorizing paperwork necessary for payment. C, drawing up a de demolition plan or D, forming a selection committee. 
Answer B is the correct answer here. Authorizing paperwork for contractor payment is one duty of a contract administrator. An RFP outlines what will be done during a new building project. A demolition plan is completed to indicate which components of a facility will be removed during a renovation project. A selection committee is chosen during the first stage of a project to help choose a design firm. Which of the following is least likely to be included on a punch list for substantially completed projects? A, equipment planning for an expansion project. B, plugged condensate drains in HVAC units. C, cracked fascia over waiting room entrances. D, missing hand railing in geriatric wards. Answer A is the correct answer here. Equipment planning for an expansion project would not be included on a punch list of things that need to be done by a contractor. A plugged condensate drain would be included as would a cracked fascia over a waiting room entrance. Essential items such as handrails that are missing would also be included. Which of the following would motivate a general contractor to bring a building project to completion at a lower cost? A, a cost plus fixed fee with upset figure contract. B, a cost plus fixed fee contract. C, a cost plus percentage contract. Or D, a guaranteed maximum price contract. Answer D is the correct answer here. A guaranteed maximum price contract fixes a maximum price for a project and would encourage a contractor to complete the job at a lower cost. Why are some CHFMs considering alternatives to tra traditional intensive care units, or ICUs? A, because of the te technological advances provided by bedside computing. B, because patients in ICUs are more likely to get infections. C, because ICU nurses are paid more than regular nurses. D, because the experts committee published a document on ICU economics. Answer B is the best answer here. Patients in an ICU are prone to infection because of the high humidity, warmth, and low lighting levels found in ICUs. Bedside computing merely offers caregivers improved technology to reduce medication mistakes and the amount of time needed to do paperwork. While some ICU nurses may earn more than regular nurses, that would not be a reason to look for alternatives to ICUs. An experts committee is concerned with making decisions that allow a construction or renovation project to progress on schedule. What is the purpose of ordering a post-occupancy evaluation six to 18 months after a major project is completed. A, to identify equipment that is not operating at optimum efficiency. B, to generate an operational space program document. C, to solicit opinions from disabled people who frequent the new area. D, to show changes on as-built drawings modified from their original form. Answer C is the best answer here. Soliciting opinions from staff and users of the facility, including disabled people, can measure how well the goals of a project were met. Determining this is a major purpose of a post-occupancy evaluation. Determining equipment efficiency to make sure there are no problems is the role of maintenance personnel. An operational space program document provides the design architect with the information he or she needs to begin the schematic design for a project and as-built drawings are part of the design process and are derived from prints and other drawings. Which of the following is a characteristic of socially responsible design? A, the design is based on information gathered from visits to other facilities. B, the design complies with HIPAA privacy laws. C, the design should not significantly increase capital costs on a per bed basis, and D, the design should allow for acuity adaptable patient rooms for the critically ill. Answer A is the best answer here. 
Gathering information from visits to other facilities is one of the five characteristics of socially responsible design. HIPAA privacy laws mandate that telephones must be secure. Per bed capital costs are taken into account when setting up a bedside computing system. And acuity adaptable patient rooms are an alternative to ICUs. A lack of pre-designed planning during the design phase of a healthcare facility can result in which of the following? A, a physical plant that is capable of carrying the workload. B, an increase in the risk of infection in the facility. C, a project that is not consistent with the facility's capital investment strategy. D, a decision to renovate the facility because of disruption. C, is the correct answer here. A lack of pre-designed planning can result in a project that is not consistent with the organization's capital investment strategy and could cause an increase in operating costs. Carrying the facility's workload is a benchmark that surveyors use in accreditation. Infection Risk Control Assessment, or ICRA, is employed to control the risk of infection in planning, design, and construction, and maintenance. Facility disruption due to a lack of pre-designed planning would be related to building as opposed to renovating. This concludes the planning, design, and construction portion of the CSHI CHFM study guide.